Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, Plant Powered Metro New York's program this evening. The, uh, the key to men's health is in the kitchen. And uh, my name is Liana Levine Reisner. I'm the network director of Plant Powered Metro New York. We are a community based organization that's committed to our collective health empowerment through whole food, plant based nutrition which is an evidence-based approach to nutrition that can help prevent, treat, and even reverse common chronic diseases. So uh, normally we prefer to present our programming live, uh, but we continue to uh, enjoy everybody's presence in the cloud uh, in this virtual space. Thank you so much for being here. Um, tonight's program is uh, going to dig into some topics that might be a little bit taboo out there but are incredibly important for men's health um, we have joining us tonight two wonderful urologists from nyu and i'm going to just do a quick intro of both of them now and um and you'll hear from them consecutively and we'll also hopefully have a little testimonial story in the middle from somebody who has experienced uh an Pretty incredible change uh, thanks to plant-based nutrition. So Dr. Stacy Loeb will be starting our program tonight. Uh, she is a board certified urologist at New York University School of Medicine and the Manhattan Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Dr. Loeb is an expert in prostate cancer and men's health with more than 300 peer-reviewed published articles and 10 book chapters. She also hosts the Men's Health Show on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. And Dr. Boren, James Boren is Assistant Professor of Urology and Director of Endourology at the NYU Langone Med Medical Center. He attended Yale University where he was first team All-America in fencing and a member of the US National Fencing Team. This is trivia, by the way. He continued his education at Yale Medical School followed by a urology re residency at the Mount Sinai Medical Center and a fellowship in endourology and robotic surgery at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Boren was previously Director of Robotic Surgery and Director of the Executive Health Program at the University of Maryland. He has helped pioneer surgical techniques for kidney stones and has written over 30 papers and book chapters on minimally invasive urologic surgery. He has taught numerous national and international courses on advanced laparos laparos laparoscopic and robotic techniques. Dr. Boren's clinical practice focuses on minimally invasive treatment of kidney cancer, kidney stones, and reconstructive ureteral surgery. I had to look up how to pronounce that before we started tonight. Um, but thank you both for being with us. And I'm going to turn it over to Stacy now, who has some slides to share with us. So Stacy, why don't you take it away? Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm just looking for the icon here to share the slides. OK. So let's see. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about a couple of big issues in men's health. Hopefully everyone is able to see the screen. Everyone able to see the screen? Yes, great. Okay, so uh, we will be discussing prostate cancer and erectile dysfunction. Just to give a little bit of background, what actually is the prostate? So I'm gonna circle it here in yellow. This is an organ in men. It's near the bladder, urethra, and rectum. It has a function in reproduction, but is not needed to live. And uh, another important term to know is prostate-specific antigen, or PSA. This is a substance that's made by the prostate, and it can be measured in the blood. So this is a blood test that is used to screen for prostate cancer and to monitor prostate cancer um, after treatment or if it hasn't yet been treated, where if the number goes up, it would be an indicator that the cancer is progressing. Prostate cancer is the most common cancer in US men. Uh, as you can see in the top diagram, the bottom diagram on this slide is the 2020 uh, American Cancer Society statistics for cancer deaths and prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in US men. Now there are several risk factors for prostate cancer that are uh, quote non-modifiable or um, 
could not be changed. Uh, one of them is simply age. As men get older, the risk increases. African-American men have a higher risk of prostate cancer and of prostate cancer death. And uh, men with a family history of prostate cancer have about a two and a half times greater risk of prostate cancer. That being said, uh, family history actually constitutes more than just your genetics, since many of us share other things with our families, including environmental exposures, lifestyle habits, the things that we eat, some of the activities that we do, and screening practices, where if somebody in your family is diagnosed with something, such as prostate cancer, you may be more likely to get tested than somebody else. So the term family history actually encompasses more than just that. So how do we parse out these influences? Well, uh, one way is called twin studies, and here, we look at the concordance in cancer rates between identical twins and fraternal twins. And these studies have shown that about half of prostate cancer is accounted for by hereditary genetic risk factors. So the bad news is that that's something we can't change. The good news is the other half is potentially modifiable. So we're actually still left with quite a lot that we can work with. Now, here's some statistics from around the world regarding prostate cancer incidence. This is a heat map where the darker regions are where there is a higher incidence of prostate cancer. So you can see in this map that the United States, Australia, parts of Northern Europe are some of the highest incidence regions in the world for prostate cancer. So we're in a very high risk place. Now, what happens if you move? So this is uh, really some interesting studies and there's quite a few of these, they call them migration studies. So for example, one very famous study is regarding people who move from Japan, which is a very low risk country, to USA, which is a high risk country. And so maybe you can guess the answer, it's, this is very interesting, but Japanese living in Japan have the lowest risk. The Japanese who moved to Hawaii had an intermediate risk between the Japanese in Japan and the Caucasians living in Hawaii who were born there. So something about moving to this country increased the prostate cancer risk. So what exactly could this be? Well, uh, for one thing, it's very interesting to compare some dietary patterns between different countries, just as sort of an ecological assessment. So just for your consideration, I have up here, right next to the prostate cancer incidence map, you can see the map on the top in blue is per capita milk consumption. And uh, it's you know pretty much mirroring some of the patterns that we see with uh, the United States, Australia, and Europe being the very heavy blue regions with the highest per capita milk consumption. And underneath that is the meat consumption per capita. And again, we're seeing uh, the dark red with the highest meat consumption is uh, US, Australia, and some of the other countries with the highest prostate cancer risk. So these sort of Western dietary patterns um, do definitely appear to track with prostate cancer. Now, there have been quite a lot of individual studies on different dietary factors and prostate cancer risk. And the good news is that there are quite a few things that have been shown to be potentially beneficial when it comes to reducing prostate cancer risk. Uh, a big one is tomatoes which have a substance called lycopene, which is thought to be helpful. Cruciferous vegetables, this is your big green leafy vegetables. This is helpful in terms of reducing risk. Soy and fish have both been associated with reduced risk, as well as coffee and green tea. So I was really happy about this as a coffee drinker. Now on the harmful side, we have dairy and meat. 
Now, meat is linked to other forms of cancer as well. This is a graphic uh, from the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer. And processed meats are considered a grade one carcinogen. So basically uh, similar to smoking in the sense that they are thought to cause cancer. Definitive evidence. Uh, this is things like hot dogs, bacon, salami. Uh, then tier 2A, which is probably causes cancer, includes beef, pork, and lamb. Now, why exactly is meat carcinogenic? So there's a couple of things going on here. Some of it inherent to the meat itself and others uh, related to the process of cooking meat. Uh, unlike plant-based foods, meat traditionally would be cooked at high temperatures in order to get rid of uh, bacteria and things like that. And so the process of this high temperature cooking leads to the formation of these cancer-causing substances like heterocyclic amines. So part of the carcinogenic effect comes from the high temperature cooking process and then inherent to the meat itself, there are some specific factors. Uh, there's hormonal effects and also just the nutrient composition where, for example, plant foods have higher levels of antioxidants, antioxidants and other anti-cancer substances. This is a review article that was published uh, just in the past year where they looked at the totality of different studies on different dietary patterns. And they basically concluded that consumption of higher amounts of plant-based foods may be associated with a de decreased prostate cancer risk and consumption of higher amounts of dairy products may be associated with increased risk. Uh, just a word on overall lifestyle. Uh, Maintaining a healthy weight is extremely important. There's been many studies linking obesity or uh, overweight with an increased risk of advanced prostate cancer. It was about a 5% increase for every five unit increase in the body mass index, which is a measurement of obesity. Um, and physical activity is very important as well. So you can achieve a small reduction in prostate cancer risk and mortality with increased physical activity. Now, what about people who already have prostate cancer? It is never too late. And in fact, it's extremely important to adhere to these same principles. In fact, the American Cancer Society has a series of survivorship guidelines with recommendations for prostate cancer survivors. And these include maintaining a healthy weight, doing at least 150 minutes a week of physical activity, eating a diet high in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and avoiding smoking. Now, here's a very interesting clinical trial looking at intensive lifestyle programs for men who already have prostate cancer. Now, these were men with low-risk prostate cancer. They did not undergo any form of treatment. And group one was randomly assigned to do an intensive lifestyle program where they did a vegan diet with supplements, aerobic exercise, and stress management, including yoga and meditation and group two was assigned to no intensive lifestyle program. And then they followed them over the course of time. And a year later in group one, the intensive lifestyle program, none of the men had progressed or had treatment. The PSA, which I mentioned earlier is the test for prostate cancer actually went down. So it suggested that the disease was staying stable and they had a significant lowering of their cholesterol. Whereas in group two, where they did not do the intensive lifestyle program, six progressed to treatment. Overall, the PSA level increased, suggesting that perhaps in some cases the cancer was progressing and there was an increase in cholesterol. Um, and by the way, there was no difference in testosterone between the groups. So they did conclude that the intensive lifestyle program was successful. 
So some take home messages for prostate cancer, uh, very important to avoid dairy, processed meat, even red meat, uh, increase intake of green leafy vegetables, tomatoes, great source of lycopene and whole grains. And all this should be done along with exercise and maintaining a healthy weight. Uh, next topic is erectile dysfunction, which is defined as the inability to attain or maintain penile erection sufficient for satisfactory sexual performance. This is extremely common condition and it can be a harbinger of underlying cardiovascular disease or issues with the heart and the blood vessels. So as you can imagine, erection is all about blood flow. Uh, if the blood, if the arteries and the blood vessels are clogged elsewhere in the body, the same process can, it's a systemic process, so this can be occurring in the penis as well. And if the blood flow isn't getting there, then it's problematic. But sometimes that's the presenting complaint. So in fact, they've found that erectile dysfunction may actually precede the onset of some kind of cardiovascular event by up to five years. That is to say, five years later, there's a heart attack, a stroke, something like that. And this is really very important, especially in young men who may present with erection issues where they have up to a 50 times increased risk of later having a cardiovascular event. So this is a really important moment to intervene and try to improve on lifestyle. So our guidelines now from the American Urological Association, which is our professional society, they really emphasize erectile dysfunction as an actual marker of cardiovascular disease. And they emphasize the importance of lifestyle modification, including changes in diet and an increase in physical activity to improve overall health and erectile health, which is really kind of a barometer of the heart. So what are the risk factors for erectile dysfunction? Uh, really the same risk factors you have for heart attacks or any other cardiovascular problem, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and all of these can be reduced with a plant-based diet, whole food plant-based diet. Also obesity, inflammation, and smoking. This is a review article uh, about erectile dysfunction, uh, reviewing the literature of different dietary patterns. And what they found across the board is that men who did not have problems with erections were more likely to have a diet that was high in fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and fish, and that was low in processed meat, red meat, and refined grains. So this is some of the ways why plant-based foods can support erectile function. It's important for improvement in blood flow and reducing just atherosclerosis around the body. It can also improve nerve function. Plant-based foods have antioxidant properties and inflammation is really critical to reduce because it can cause endothelial dysfunction or um, the cells that line the blood vessels are damaged by inflammation and also weight loss. So I just want to end with some suggested resources. I think the documentary Game Changers is really very useful and actually has a segment on erections. Uh, so if this is something you want more information, I recommend that. Yeah. Uh, any um, other great documentary I books? I like the Happy Cow app, which helps to find plant-based food, especially if you're traveling or in a different area. And there's several websites. And actually, if you go to the Plant Powered Metro New York website, there is a resources page with a lot of this information. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Loeb, so much uh, for sharing this overview for us. Um, I want to see first if there are any specific questions that have come in for you. Um, uh, let's do this one first. Is there a best first step for someone with erectile dysfunction to take in order to treat or cure it? 
I mean, it's never too late to try lifestyle modification, even if you already have erectile dysfunction, because the goal is not to let anything progress. And, you know, the good news is there are a lot of treatments for erectile dysfunction, um, you know, but they become more invasive as you move up the line. So it's better to, at the very least, stop it in its tracks. So you don't want there to be any more hardening of the blood vessels or any more inflammation. So it's, it's not too late once you have it to still make lifestyle changes. You know, anyone who's having problems with erections, definitely avoiding smoking and then, you know, avoiding some of these uh, really inflammatory foods uh, and maintaining a healthy weight are all going to be very important to at least maintain, if not reverse, some of the negative changes. Great. And, and when we talk about whole food, plant-based nutrition, um, you know, we often emphasize how uh, whole foods, the foods that as they present from the earth are, are the best way to go. But even so, are there specific supplements or even herbs um, that sort of ha- could do something to help reverse uh, erectile dysfunction specifically? Um, I mean, I think it's best to try to get more of these nutrients and antioxidants through the food when possible. There isn't like any specific supplement that uh, has been shown to reverse erectile dysfunction. Um, Supplements could definitely be used in conjunction with a healthy diet, but I wouldn't have it substitute. Great. Thank you. Um, What I want to do right now as a segue between Dr. Loeb and Dr. Boren's talk is to bring forward um, Demetrius Partridge, who has a really wonderful story to share with us. Um, about his personal experience. And I'm not going to steal his thunder, um, but have a little conversation with Demetrius here. And I'm going to quickly spotlight his video so you can see him. Hello, how are you, Demetrius? Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Great. Thank you for joining us. Um, Can you share, tell us a little bit about what happened related to your prostate and um, what you did with it and how how you saw changes? Well, I went to the doctor for a checkup. I wasn't feeling well in the groinal area. I was urinating quite a bit, and he took some um, CAT scans and sonograms and came up with a lesion on my prostate that was one inch, and he was very concerned and sent me to a specialist who uh, was a surgeon. He wanted to remove my prostate and do a a, uh, biopsy, and... uh, as soon as I heard that, I was, uh, you know, did some research. I went on YouTube and looked up prostate and saw all the things that you could do to avoid getting a, uh, what do you call it, the exam, to stick the needles in through your, it's, it's a, you know, it wasn't something I wanted to do. So I looked up and I found quite a few things on the internet on how to, change your diet and I followed it. I started drinking pH balanced water, became a vegan and lost weight. And, uh, and I kept in, went to a second doctor and he also wanted to do the surgery right away and it set me up. And one was at Mount Sinai, one was at New York Presbyterian and I kept going to the best doctor. So I finally found one guy who says, listen, I'll give you the chance that you want because my m- wife is concerned that uh, I'm not listening to the doctors. And I was insisting that I should you know, try this vegan thing and see how it works. And it worked, right? After three months, I went back and they, they did the sonograms and the CAT scans and whatever the hell they did with all those pictures. And they found that the, the lesion was reduced by almost 50% and was getting better. And the doctor said, hey, you're doing whatever you're doing. It's working. Well, just keep doing it. And uh, that was a year ago. And... Uh, I did not get, I still have my, I still love my prostate. I still have it. And I have no problem with erection. You can ask my wife. She's coming back. <laughs> Thanks, Demetrius. Can you tell, can you tell our viewers here a little more about what you, what you ate, what you eat to, um, to be uh, healthy and how that, how that uh, was different much, from before? Well, I, I eat, every day I eat oatmeal every morning. I, I like that one that uh, comes in a can, the uh, real, good one. It takes like 40 minutes to cook. I wake up in the morning. I put that on the pot and 
and go take a shower by the time I come down, it's ready. I put lots of blueberries, eat lots of blueberries, nuts, no sugars, no more breads, no more milk, no more dairy. Uh, I would eat some fish. Uh, that's another story altogether where I went on a fish diet for a few years after I was diagnosed with high blood pressure and, and uh, cholesterol. Uh, so I got rid of that, but I ended up with mercury poison because I ate so much fish. So I stopped eating fish for a year. Uh, but now I'm on the whole food plant base and, you know, it changed my life. I'm 65 years old and my little guy salutes me every morning. I got no complaints. <laughs> Great. And can you share a little bit about the other health uh, conditions that you had that you saw changes with as you shifted your diet? Oh, aches and pains. I've been taking turmeric in my tea. Turmeric is amazing. It's just amazing. I turned my brother, who's old, I'm the youngest of five, and he just lost his mind. He's like, my God, I've had aches and pains in this turmeric. You saved my life. So all this stuff does work. There's no doubt about it. Great. And you had a family history of... of oh, yeah. My, my father died of pancreatic cancer. My two brothers had several heart attacks, and they were my inspiration. But not everyone can do this, though. I, I, I see people who ask me about prostate, and when I tell them they have to give up your drinking your beer and drinking your coffee and, and eating this food, they look at me like, nah, I don't think I can do it. I'm like, you'd rather take the pills? You'd rather be sick? You'd rather get your prostate removed? I mean, seriously, you you got to want to do it. That's the problem. People are just, not everyone's the same. Yeah, for sure. Um, what What really... What keeps you on, on the straight and narrow now? I like living. I like living healthy. I don't like taking pills. I do not take any pills at all. Zero. I take vitamins. That's it. And I take the ones I need, and that's it. And I eat properly. And if I straight, I mean, a little poison every once in a while. I might have a grass-fed steak once a month uh, just to be social with other people. Uh, but other than that, I prefer greens and beans and lentils and you name it. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing your story, Demetrius. And if, and if any folks here have questions, uh, I'm willing to field them as well for, for Demetrius. Uh, you can put them in the chat. Um, I'm going to go back to Dr. Loeb for a moment because there was a question that came in about poultry. Um, you didn't mention that as a high-risk dietary factor. Is there any implication of, of uh, chicken or turkey in prostate issues or or is it really just the dairy and the meat that we have evidence for? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, in terms of prostate cancer specifically, it would not be as high risk an item as processed meat, uh, red meat and pork. Um, however, uh, I also wouldn't consider it a health food. Um, there's quite a lot about chicken in the How Not to Die book. I think that would be worth reading. Um, one, I mean, there's a lot of other health issues and some that are germane to erectile dysfunction in terms of the chicken, uh, sodium levels uh, for um, high blood pressure. There's a lot of uh, fats in the chicken and um, they're raised, uh, well, most chicken in this country at least is sourced from factory farms with hormones and antibiotics. So uh, I would just be very cautious about that. You know, we've seen a lot of antibiotic resistance um, for prostate biopsy, for example. You know, sometimes even though we give antibiotics, the infection is resistant to antibiotics. And the problem is that it's just in our food supply because uh, in the process of raising these chickens and these very crowded farms in order to prevent them from dying from disease, they have to give massive amounts of antibiotics. I think 75% um, of antibiotics in this whole country are used for animals, for you know, livestock and chickens. So anyway, I think uh, there's definitely a lot of concerns about chicken. So perhaps less so specifically for prostate cancer than some of the other sources of meat. Uh, but um, I think it, there could be other sources of protein that might have less of these side issues. 
Gotcha. Great. Thank you, Dr. Loeb. Excellent. I think what we'll do now is uh, turn it over to Dr. Boren and, um, and we'll come back to other questions. If anything comes up, uh, please feel free to put it in the chat box. Um, and thanks again to Demetrius for being so open and sharing. It's definitely, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult to share these private stories, but at the same time, they, may, they, ha they make such a difference. So really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, my, my pleasure. And I don't eat any processed foods anymore. And uh, it, it's worth, your health is worth it. What else do you have? Money is worthless without your health. So uh, that's my message. Excellent. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, Dr. Boren. Okay, so here we go. I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, well, I'd like to thank Demetrius, and I'd like to thank the other participants for uh, their questions and, and for listening. Um, I'd like to also give a shout out to my mother who was listening. It was her birthday the other day, so happy birthday. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Loeb for giving the talk on erectile dysfunction, so I did not have to give it to my mother. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about men's health and kidney stones. So a little bit of background on kidney stones. Uh, the lifetime prevalence of kidney stones in the United States is about 9%. That means that uh, about 1 in 11 people will get a kidney stone in their lifetime, and this number is increasing uh, um, over the last 20 to 30 years uh, and has increased in all industrialized countries. And a lot of it is due to an increase in animal protein in our diets, also sedentary lifestyle, obesity, and climate change. Um, more men than women get kidney stones, uh, about 11% of men and about 7% of women. Um, white men tend to have a higher risk um, than non-Caucasian men. Um, and about 25% of kidney stone formers will have a family history of stones. And similar to what uh, Stacy talked about, uh, when we look at twin studies, it seems that about 50% of, of, um, of the stone disease is, has a genetic component to it. Um, and the other, one, the other part of it is probably environmental. Uh, if you get a stone, you have about a 50% chance of getting another stone in the next five to 10 years. And even though we see stones in newborns uh, up to people in their 80s and 90s, the, the oldest person that I've ever operated on was about 96 years old, uh, but the peak age is in the 30s to the 50s. And the most common stone type is a calcium oxalate stone, uh, and that's found in about 75% of people. Uh, the other type is, a, is called a um, uric acid stone in about 10%. I'll talk a little bit about that. So anyone who's gotten a stone knows that a kidney stone is very, very uncomfortable. It is not something that you want uh, to get, and it's certainly not something that you want to get again. So what causes stones? Well, there are a number of different factors that can contribute to stone formation. So on the one hand, we have things in your urine, such as calcium and oxalate. And the other part of the equation is how much urine you make. So if you think about a glass of water, if you have half a glass of water and you put, you sprinkle some salt in it and you stir it around, the salt will dissolve. Well, you could keep doing that, sprinkle more salt and more salt and more salt in the water. Eventually you will reach a point where the salt can't dissolve anymore. And that's what happens in your urine. When you have so many uh, of these risk factors, such as calcium or oxalate in the urine, eventually they can't dissolve and they become crystals. Uh, if you have a very low volume of urine, meaning you're not drinking enough fluid and you're not making a lot of urine, then even a smaller amount of calcium or oxalate in the urine is going to be potentially turned into crystal, whereas a larger amount of urine will be able to dissolve even more of these substances. So the goal in kidney stone prevention is increasing the amount of urine you have by drinking fluids and decreasing the amount of the bad things in the urine, and that's where the diet comes in. So one of the big myths in kidney stones is that everyone knows kidney stones are made of calcium, so you should stay away from calcium. And so doctors used to tell people, don't eat calcium, stay away from dairy and other sources of calcium because you're going to get a kidney stone again. So in 2002, a landmark study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine 
and they looked at people who had kidney stones and had excessive amounts of calcium in their urine to begin with. And they said, okay, well, what if we change these people's diet? And one group got a low calcium diet, and the other group had a normal calcium diet. Uh, and that was defined uh, as around 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium. They were put on a low animal protein diet and low salt. And sure enough, what happened is at about five years, about 20% of the people who were put on the modified diet got another kidney stone compared to almost 50% of the people who were put on the low calcium diet. So it turns out that if you have a low calcium diet, what happens is your body needs calcium to function. And so if you don't get the calcium in your diet, your body will take it from your bones and it will take too much and excess calcium will spill into the urine and that will put you at risk for getting more kidney stones. So what about eating a lot of calcium? Well, this was an interesting study. This is a part of a, a large uh, survey of about 27,000 people uh, that was conducted over a decade. And they asked them, what kind of supplements are you taking? And they found that over 50% of the people in this group took some type of supplement in the past month. And the most common supplements were either vitamin C, E, and D, or minerals such as calcium, zinc, and magnesium. But they looked at all different kinds of vitamins and minerals. And what they found was that following these people over several years, there was no benefit to taking a supplement with regard to decreasing your risk of death from any cause. So people who took supplements did not have a less risk of dying compared to people who didn't take supplements. What they found was that people who took an adequate amount, sort of the recommended daily amount of vitamin A, vitamin K, magnesium, and zinc, when it was from a food source, not from supplements, but from food, these people reduced their risk of cardiovascular and cancer death. When they looked at people who took calcium supplements, 1,000 milligrams or more per day, those people had an increased risk of cancer mortality. So increased risk of dying from cancer for taking calcium supplements. Now, this is just one study. This was a, what we call a retrospective review where they asked people what kind of foods they were taking and supplements, and they looked back. So it's, it's, not, it's not the highest degree of evidence, but it's certainly suggestive that maybe, first of all, supplements in people who don't have any sort of deficit are not helpful um, at the very least and, and may be damaging in some cases. Um, I certainly do think that people who have deficits, low levels of, of, of these minerals or vitamins will benefit from a supplementation. But for the average person off the street who doesn't have a deficit, it may not be beneficial. Uh, the primary way that we should be getting these minerals and vitamins is from food, natural food sources. So what are the, some of the risk factors for kidney stones? Well, as I talked about, a low amount of urine from dehydration, not drinking enough. People who have recurrent urinary tract infections have an increased risk of stones. People who are on high animal protein diet people who have bowel disease or have had a significant surgery on their bowels and people who have gout. So a very interesting study was done uh, just a few months ago and it looked at the risk of, of uh, diet uh, on kidney stones and it looked at um, various diets as well as vegetarian and vegan diets. Uh, what they found not surprisingly was that sugar is bad. Sugar is bad for many things. Um, when you eat sugar, it increases the amount of calcium, oxalate, as well as uric acid in your urine. And these are all risk factors for forming stones. So people who drank one sugar-sweetened drink per day had about an increased risk of kidney stones of 33%. Uh, one cola per day. Now, cola meaning a dark soda. There actually may be some protective effect of a clear diet soda, something like Fresco or Sprite, those may have some protective effects, but the dark sodas like Coke and Pepsi increase the risk by 23%. Orange juice is very beneficial, decreases the risk of stones by 12%, and coffee decreased the risk by 30%. And that's a combination of substances in the coffee and also some of the caffeine. 
So, uh, so the, the main uh, types of stone are calcium oxalate. We talked a little bit about calcium. Well, what about oxalate? So oxalate is a little bit confusing because many oxalate foods are healthy. Many of them have a good amount of calcium in them. And we want you to have calcium in your diet. Uh, but there are a few that are very bad. They have very high levels of oxalate. And these are the foods that we will tell you to avoid. Rhubarb, um, very uncommonly eaten food. Uh, spinach is probably the most commonly eaten food that we will tell stone formers to try and avoid or have in moderation at least, as well as rice bran. Other foods that have a high level of oxalate, beets, potatoes, beans, almonds, cocoa powder, or chocolate, um, corn, uh, cornmeal, and oat bran. How about salt? Well, salt is bad for a variety of things. Uh, your body needs about 500 milligrams of salt, uh, of sodium per day. The average American eats about 3,400 milligrams a day. And in a study from Italy, they found that the Italians in this study ate 8,000 to 10,000 milligrams a day. So the U.S. recommended daily allowance of salt is less than 2,300 milligrams per day. And the amount of salt recommended in the DASH diet, which is an anti-hypertension diet, is actually only 1,500 milligrams or less. So just to give you an example for comparison, one teaspoon of salt is 2,300 milligrams of sodium. That's your entire allowance for the day, one teaspoon of salt. So some common high sodium foods are smoked, cured, or canned meat, or fish, salted beans, olives, packaged entrees, cheese, salted nuts, and soy sauce. These are all things that you want to try and avoid, or at least if you're going to have them, look for the low sodium version. So uh, the, um, the U.S. Uh, Dietary Association comes out every several years with dietary guidelines for all Americans. You may remember the food pyramid. When we were all kids, there was a food pyramid um, with, with um, uh, 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 different types of foods at the bottom and and, and uh, lesser amounts of other foods at the top. Now they don't have a pyramid. They just have a recommendation of things that you should try to incorporate in your diet. So fruits, vegetables, um, uh, protein, low fat dairy, uh, whole grains and oils. Uh, you should try and avoid sugars and sodium and saturated fats. Uh, and this, um, this brochure gives a very detailed guidance on what, some of the things that we should be trying to incorporate in our diet are. Um, so how does, this re how does this compare with kidney stone risk? Well, the all-American diet tends to have a lot of salt, protein, and not a lot of vegetables. A vegetarian diet, uh, because it is, tends to be increased amount of dairy in the diet, tends to have a higher amount of calcium. Um, you can overload on oxalate on a vegetarian diet, if, depending on what kind of vegetables you eat. And if you're being careful, you tend to have a lower salt diet if you're not eating a lot of processed foods. Now, the vegan diet also tends to be lower in salt, uh, maybe lower in calcium if you're not careful in the foods that you eat, uh, and may also be increased in oxalate. So how can we sort of improve this to make it friendly for stones? Uh, well, we can, f we can look at the DASH diet as a diet that is uh, preventive for hypertension, uh, also uh, uh, similar to what's known as a Mediterranean diet, uh, people on these types of diets had a 40% reduction in their, uh, in their risk of developing kidney stones. And the other benefit is lowering blood pressure, stroke, heart attack, diabetes, and obesity. So comparing the DASH diet with the recommended kidney stone prevention diet, uh, we can see the DASH diet doesn't really talk about fluid, but for a stone diet, we want to, to take in somewhere around two and a half or three liters, which is almost 100 ounces of fluid a day. It can be water, it could be coffee, uh, it could be um, uh, uh, sugar-free lemonade. Uh, any sort of fluid you put in your body is, is gonna be good for the most part. Uh, each diet wants about five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, carbohydrates in, term, in the form of whole grains. Uh, the DASH diet talks about two servings of low-fat dairy. The stone diet says we want you to have calcium. It doesn't have to come from dairy, but we want you to have about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how we can get that with, when uh, we avoid dairy. Um, the DASH diet says 
two servings or less of animal protein, stone diet, six ounces or less, but I think we can cut out animal protein altogether. Uh, the DASH diet wants some amount of nuts or seeds. Uh, stone diet wants you to avoid excessive amounts of nuts because they contain oxalate. And both diets want you to avoid salt. If you can get it down to below 1,500 milligrams a day, that is very, very good. So there are uh, many of my kidney stone patients uh, uh, tell me, you know, how can I get calcium in my diet if I don't, uh, uh, if I don't eat, eat milk? Uh, or dairy. And so there are a number of non-dairy sources of calcium, chia seeds, chickpeas, broccoli, kale. Um, broccoli and kale do have some oxalate in them, but they tend to be lower than some of the other foods. So they're, they're fine. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, plant-based milks. So uh, Dr. Loeb and I and some of our colleagues uh, looked into uh, what are some of the better plant-based milks to have uh, if you have kidney stones. This is unpublished data. It's submitted to a journal. We hope it'll be published soon. Uh, but when you look at standard regular old milk, fat-free milk, uh, we can see it has a, a pretty good amount of calcium. It fulfills about 30% of the recommended daily allowance of calcium. It has a lot of potassium. And potassium is very good in preventing kidney stones. Uh, it does have a moderate amount of sodium, um, 130 milligrams, and about somewhere around uh, five to 10% of the recommended daily allowance. And uh, it has a very low amount of oxalate. So the challenge is how can we find something that we can substitute for regular old milk that would also be protective against kidney stones. And so there are a couple of options. Uh, soy milk is one, it has a good amount of calcium, good amount of potassium, it's low in sodium. It does have a modest amount of oxalate. So this is not something that you wanna overload on. Macadamia milk has a very high amount of calcium in it, uh, but it has low potassium. It also has low sodium and low oxalate. So it's a good source of, of calcium. It's not gonna hurt you um, with, with, other, with, with sodium and oxalate. Uh, similarly, oat milk uh, doesn't have quite as much calcium in it, but it has very good potassium, low sodium, and a modest amount of oxalate. So soy, macadamia, and oats seem to be the plant-based milks that are gonna be probably the most protective and the best to be substituted for a dairy milk uh, if you're a kidney stone former. So you know we give out all this advice to our patients and some of them take it and some of them don't. Um, so this is a patient of mine who had a uric acid stone and he was a little obese. You can see this is right up here is his kidney and this white thing right here is a kidney stone. That's about the size of a golf ball, so quite a large stone. Um, but we can do some things looking at the CAT scan. We measured the size of the stone. We measured how hard the stone is. And we also measured how much acid was in his urine. And all these things we put together and figured out that this was most likely a uric acid stone. And uric acid stones tend to form in people who are overweight, often with diabetes, people who don't drink enough fluid, and people who eat too much animal protein. Uh, there are also some medications that contribute to it as well. So we changed his diet. We also put him on a medicine called potassium citrate, which is essentially a concentrated version of orange juice. And what this medicine does is it fights against the, the uh, high amount of acid in the urine. It, it finds calcium, it holds on to the calcium, prevents it from uh, 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 contributing to stones and it, it uh, buffers against the amount of acid in the urine. And so this was, uh, I saw him April, 2012. A few months later, you can see there's less stone. A few months later, there's less stone. And one year later, the stone was completely gone. Now this guy avoided a pretty extensive surgery uh, to, to remove that stone just by changing his diet and a, and a targeted supplement. So the uh, Urology Care Foundation has put out very recently a kidney stone cookbook. Uh, this is a wonderful resource. It's available free. And here's, there's the website at the bottom. Uh, the first uh, 30 or 40 pages go through risk factors for kidney stones, how you can change your diet to prevent stones. And then they incorporate a number of recipes as well, uh, which you can incorporate into your, into your cooking. Uh, but the main recommendations are drink enough fluid, eat more fruits and vegetables, 
uh, avoid excessive amounts of oxalate, uh, less meat in the diet, and you want to, if you can, have a plant-based diet, uh, uh, have a modest amount of calcium, and avoid salt. Um, some of the, again, some of the high oxalate foods that we talked about before, spinach, collard greens, baked potatoes, beets, these are all healthy foods, and I have a lot of people in my practice who are very healthy, and they say, well, I eat healthy foods, but I got kidney stones, and it's because a lot of the healthy foods they were eating were not so good for kidney stones. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Moderate amount of oxalate or low amount uh, if you can. Um, this is one of the... Um, one of the recipes in the, in the cookbook that I think is, is pretty delicious. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's just cucumber, lemon, basil, mint, and water. You can make up two liters of this, carry it around with you all day, and that will, that will uh, fulfill most of the requirements of uh, fluid intake for the day. So in summary, uh, when we talk about dietary modifications for kidney stone, this mirrors the general dietary guidelines that will help us reduce high blood pressure, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. You wanna try and avoid too much salt, sugar, and animal protein. You wanna increase your intake of plant-based protein, vegetable. And finally, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. And not only am I a surgeon, but I also played one on TV. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Boren. <laughs> Excellent. And it's so nice to see like the, the, the photos of the uric acid um, stone is just so fascinating that this actually, you can see the progression over time. Um, do you see the same kind of thing with calcium oxalate stones? Can you see that? Oh, so, no. So, so everyone asks, you know, can you dissolve calcium stones? And the answer is no. So you can't, there's no, there's no dietary changes. There's no there's no medication that we know of right now, although we're looking at a couple of things that will get rid of a calcium stone. A uric acid stone you can dissolve. The, the, the dietary changes and some of the medications that we use for calcium stones will help to prevent the stones from getting larger and help new stones from forming. So there's definitely a benefit there, but we can't, we can't dissolve them yet. Great, yeah. Um, and... Uh, I just want to pull out something that was coming through the chat in case folks haven't been paying attention. Um, you had mentioned climate change on your slide before, and um, Andrew had asked, could you explain the link between climate change and kidney stones? And um, Dr. Loeb answered about, you know, hotter climates being associated with more stones due to dehydration, which is really fascinating. Um, yep, that there's sort of this um, micro level impact on the individual person, but this macro level impact on a population wide level of what meat consumption um, can do overall. And, and just to see how the effect ripples out from the individual to the communal and the public health perspective, it's, it's just really quite transformational to see um, how, how something so small as a kidney stone can really like teach us a lot about our, our global health. Um, there was another question that came through here, one second. Um, Baked potatoes. Um, do baked potatoes include all other forms of potatoes as well in terms of being dangerous or high in oxalates for those with calcium oxalate stones? So it's the, it, it's the skin of the potato that is more, uh, more at risk for, for oxalates. Um, um, the uh, different potatoes have different content of oxalates. We mostly think of the, you know, the white potato as, as the one that's where it's like French fries and, and such. But the, um, the skin of the, so, you know, if you like potatoes and you want to have them, pe peel the skin off, even though that has a lot of nutrients in it, it has a lot of oxalate in it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, or eat potatoes, 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 potatoes,
That's okay. Uh, we, we can either try try again. Dr. Love, you want to try again? See if the audio comes back normal. And if not, you can put it in the chat box. I'm so sorry. Right, to eat with the calcium. Okay, gotcha. So for the oxalate foods, it's important to eat, um, eat the, uh, the foods that are, you were saying higher in calcium, is that correct? Gotcha. Um, a question for Dr. Boren, have you seen kidney issues or stone development arise from patients who drink um, Himalayan salt water daily? This sounds like a very um, alternative, uh, alternative health kind of thing to do. So there, I, I've not seen that personally. I have had one or two people who have, um, uh, have talked about getting some. So um, salt, I mean, salt, where, wherever it comes from uh, is, is bad for stones. Um, it, it depends on what the salt con if it's just a touch of Himalayan salt, then, then that's fine. Um, but, uh, what happens is our bodies love salt. You know, we were, we, we started off billions of years ago in the ocean surrounded by salt. So our bodies love salt. So what happens is when we eat salty foods, it gets into our bloodstream. Mm -hmm. The salt goes into our kidneys because the kidneys love it. And in exchange, salt goes in and calcium goes out. So the calcium goes into the urine and that's what causes the kidney stones. So we find that people who have excess amounts of calcium in their urine, if they also have high levels of salt, if we put them on a low salt diet, lo and behold, when they reduce the amount of salt they take in their diet, it also reduces the amount of calcium that spills into the urine and decreases the amount of kidney stones they get. Great. And a few other questions have come in. Um, have you seen, uh, actually, let's stick with that for a second. Oh, there, there was a follow-up on, on potatoes. Are the skins of sweet potatoes similar to white potatoes or other white varieties? Uh, yeah, yeah. All, I mean, all, all potatoes have, have oxalate. I think the white potatoes are the worst in terms of, okay. in, in terms of oxalate content. Gotcha. Okay. And... Um, there was a recipe mentioned with cucumber and basil. Oh, I think that was for uh, for water, right? You in order to try to like get people hydrating more to Yeah, it's it's up. to make water a little bit more exciting and palatable. So, you know, you can so we tell people uh put lemon or lime in the water cuz that have that has a lot of citrate in it. Um but to make it even more more interesting, exciting, you can add some basil and some cucumber uh and and some mint um and that will not only hydrate you, but it will give you also some of the citrate that you need. Mm -hmm. And what about fruit? Another high, like high water content fruits and vegetables. Is it possible to sort of up your water intake by eating high water rich foods? So, you know, in general, we want you to have five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, if you, if there's a lot of water in the fruits uh, and, and vegetables, that will, that will count. But um um, it, it would be hard to drink and eat enough fruits and vegetables to, to make up three liters of, of fluid. Gotcha. Sure. Um, we have a number of questions. I'm going to go over just a few minutes so we can get to these questions. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Krant, does acidifying the water help? And what's up with this alkaline water trend anyway? <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's no evidence that distilled water, filtered water, you know, any of these uh, has any significant effect on, on kidney stone formation. Um, uh, people used to say, don't drink carbonated water. Uh, you know, for every study that says one thing is good, I can show you a study that says it's bad or that it's indifferent. So for the most part, water is water. Um, don't, don't spend a fortune on it. Uh, get it from the tap. Um, and in fact, there's some evidence that some of the minerals that are in tap water may actually be better than some of the filtered waters, which don't have small amounts of things like potassium and other, and other minerals that may be beneficial. Great. Um, and for Dr. Loeb, actually for either of you, is, is calcium taken in with oxalate foods always a way to eliminate that risk or, or is it just about mitigation? So, uh, so what happens is calcium and oxalate like each other. They, 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 they find each other. Oxalate is, is 
produced in plants. Uh, and the purpose of oxalate is that it pulls out calcium from the soil and from the water and gets rid of it. Um, and it goes into the leaves and the stems of the plants. So it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's to get rid of the calcium uh, that the plant doesn't need. Um, but then we eat it. Uh, so when you eat foods that, have, that are high in calcium or oxalate, one or the other, they, what happens is they get absorbed into your bloodstream. When you eat those foods together, so something that has a lot of calcium in it and something else that has a lot of oxalate in it, uh, so if you have chocolate and you drink soy milk, uh, those two will mix together. They will find each other in your stomach and they will not get absorbed into your bloodstream. So that is sort of a protective effect. But if you eat them in a sort of imbalanced way, uh, then one will get absorbed, then the other will get absorbed and they will find each other in your kidneys and in your urine and cause stones. So I think what, 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 what Dr. Lowe was talking about before is that if you want to eat spinach, for example, which is a very high oxalate food, at the same time, eat something that's high in calcium, um, like macadamia milk, uh, and that will be so, somewhat of a protective effect. Great. Excellent. Um, I want to thank both of you so much for sharing these insights. We, you know, we hear often in the whole food plant-based world about sort of the, the big diseases that are on everybody's mind, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and to dig into some of these uh, still prevalent and yet not lesser discussed uh, issues that people are facing, especially men, it's, it's just so interesting to have this time with you. And I wanna thank you both for, for the hour uh, and for taking our questions. Um, I'm going to wrap it up um, and just invite all of you to come back and continue learning with us. Um, we will have a number of programming programs over the course of the next few days. Actually, tomorrow we have a, a demo with a Bronx-based chef who's going to be showing some how to do pickling tomorrow at six o'clock and at seven o'clock a program for Spanish speakers. Um, on Sunday, a demo with uh, Chef Carol Levy, our culinary educator, and, um, and more throughout the month of July. So please do check out our calendar at our website, plantpoweredmetrony.org, and you can follow us on social media at Plant Powered MNY, uh, which I'll put in the chat as well. Um, and feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about uh, our work and about the movement that we are a part of in trying to catalyze, because this is about our health transformation. This is about what we can do that's within our grasp, that's achievable, that doesn't necessarily need a medical intervention. It just needs a kitchen intervention. So um, if you need help in the transition process and, and would like to get connected with other people who've done this before, please do reach out. You can reach us at info at ppmny.org. Um, please do feel free to join our mailing list if you haven't already. Um, and if you're inspired by this work and, and feel uh, like you can support it financially, we welcome donations as all of these, the vast majority of our programming on the web is, is free and open because we wanna get this message out as far as possible. Um, and uh, with that, I send you off on your way and wish you lots of healthy meals ahead. Um, and again, thank you, Dr. Loeb. Thank you, Dr. Boren. Thank you, Demetrius. Um, great to have all of you with us tonight. Take care.